Welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming. This is uh, exciting for me in a number of ways. Um, one, because a lot of good friends and colleagues are here, and I get to hear about their work and chat with them. Two, uh, because uh, we've spent, my, my team and I uh, have spent a, the better part of the last four years kind of building this giant data archive that we made public the first parts of a few weeks ago. And uh, this is one of the first chances that we get to kind of put it out in the world and tell you all about it and uh, uh, tell you a little bit about what we've learned from it, but hopefully interest a lot of other people in using the data to learn a lot more. So what I want to do today uh, is sort of use those data to give you the sort of big picture landscape of what educational inequality looks like in the United States and what we're learning about it from, from these new data uh, as, a, as a way of sort of setting the stage uh, for the rest of the, the conference. And so the big uh, animating questions here, the things that sort of, in, in my mind, kind of drive the work that we've been doing on this, is a set of questions around the distribution of educational opportunity in the United States, both distribution in a geographic sense and a distribution in terms of uh, by socioeconomic status, by race, and, uh, and by gender, uh, and things like that. So. Uh, what I want to show you today is sort of an answer to this first question, which is how much do educational outcomes vary across communities in the United States? And we're going to be able to answer that at a sort of level of detail that's several orders of magnitude better, finer uh, resolution than any prior data has been able to. Uh, and that, so I think that opens up an enormous uh, set of opportunities for future research and learning about how to reduce inequality. The other questions I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer as convincingly today, and, and so I'm going to put them out there as a sort of a, a challenge or an invitation to the field to sort of think more about these and think how these data and other data could help us answer that. And that is sort of why do education outcomes vary as much as they do? Is it, how much is it because of things in kids' home environments? How much is it because of childcare and preschool experiences? How much is it because of conditions in their neighborhoods? Uh, and how much is it because of, uh, features of the, the K-12 schooling system itself. Sometimes when you think of an educational outcome, so you think of graduation or test scores, since it's an educational outcome, the mind goes to educational inputs as like school must be the reason for it. But it's not clear, uh, I think as you'll see from some of the data, that school is the big driver of inequality in educational outcomes. It's clearly a driver, but whether it's the big one or whether it's the most effective place to operate is a thing I think we still need to, to learn about. And so that, that brings to the sort of third question is what can we do about it? And uh, that I'm not going to answer today, but I hope some of the work that uh, we hear about in this conference is going to lead us to those kind of answers, as well as lots of other work that people are doing and will continue to do in the future. And for the junior scholars uh, in the audience, uh, you know, the, this is, I think, uh, the, the pressing set of questions. Um, uh, I don't want to be the guy who describes educational inequality and leaves us just with a good description of the problem but no idea what to do about it. I, I hope that this leads us to figure out kind of what to do about it. So the data, uh, I'm going to tell you very quickly about the data today. Tomorrow afternoon, as Tom said, we're going to have a session uh, th that will describe where the data come from, how they're built, how they should be interpreted, what they can be used for, and give a chance for, for people to sort of play around with those data. But uh, what we have uh, is average test scores, standardized test scores for every school district in the United States on state accountability tests. Uh, the data I'll show you today is for about 11,000 plus school districts in the United States. Uh, some small ones are not included. Uh, the, da the data cover grades three to eight. They cover math and English language arts tests. Uh, they cover the years 2009 through 2013. We have breakdowns by uh, race, ethnicity, by gender, by free lunch eligibility, by English learner status, uh, and so on. Uh, in total, the data is built on a, on a 215 million test scores. That's every standardized state accountability test taken by a third to eighth grader in the United States over that five-year period. Turns out we test kids a lot. And, uh, and so my hope is that we can actually learn something from all those tests we, we gave children. And that's kind of what, what animated this project. Um, and the, the, the trick here, the thing that, uh, 
that Andrew Ho and Demetra Calagridis and Ken Shores and Ben Shear and Aaron Faley and I have sort of been doing for the last few years is trying to figure out how to take those test scores and put them on a common scale, common across states, common across grades, common across years, so that you can really look at growth rates, uh, differences between school districts across places, uh, uh, and trends over time. And so that's the, that's the big enterprise that we've been working on to make the data set here. Um, and so we'll explain that in detail tomorrow. I'm not going to talk about it today. We also have data from every school district in the United States on family so socioeconomic characteristics that comes from the census, the American Community Survey, uh, as well as data from Common Core data, which is data on enrollments in public schools and features of the public school system. I should say that uh, you'll notice up here it says it's 11,000 geographic school districts. So what we mean by a school district for, for the purposes today is a is the geographic space from which in which kids live. Think of school district as a definition of community. Kids who live in that community, we're going to describe their educational outcomes. That means whether they go to a charter school or a traditional public school, they're going to be included because of where they live. So this is based on, on sort of uh, geographic uh, living, you know, residential places, not based on administrative boundaries. So charter schools are sort of included in the public school district in which they're included. The data, we have the data broken out where charter schools are separated. We haven't made that public yet, but eventually we will. And so for questions about sort of charter schools, the, the data are amenable to that, but that's not the way that I'm going to present them today. Um, so you can get the data at ceda.stanford.edu. And, and uh, in addition to the people I already mentioned, there's uh, a number of folks at the US Department of Education who originally made the data available to us. Uh, uh, and, and worked out an agreement with the department's lawyers to allow us to make them public, so without all of their help, this wouldn't happen. And then we also had funding from IES, Spencer Foundation, William T. Grant Foundation, that have really made the work, uh, given us the time to do the work. So before I show you the data, let me just prime you to think about how you should interpret that. So average test scores uh, and differences in average test scores I think in, for our purposes here should be thought of not as solely the result of the experiences kids have in school, but the total result of all kids' experiences from the time they're born or even conception until the time they take the test. That is, they're the result of things that happen in home, things that happen in preschool, things that happen in the neighborhood, after school program, and what happens in K-12. So these aren't measures of the quality of the K-12 schools in a place, they are measures of the sum total of opportunities that kids have uh, to learn the kinds of stuff that's on the test by the time they get to, to eighth grade. Nor are they measures of intelligence. Uh, they're measures of performance. And so they're affected by the opportunities kids have to learn stuff and their motivation to actually perform on the test. So uh, sometimes people think of them in an innate sense. I think it's important to think of them as, as performance measures. And finally, I would say they're not the only thing we care about, right? There's a, there's a way in which talking about test scores can tend to kind of reify the test scores as the end result of schooling. We don't really care about how well kids do on tests. We care about their development as human beings and their ability to be sort of productive, happy, engaged members of a democratic society. Test scores are a proxy for general uh, educational opportunity, but they're certainly not the only thing we, we care about. They happen to be a thing we can measure well, so that's uh, convenient, but that doesn't, shouldn't be confused with what, what we actually care about. Um, so uh, what I want to talk about is, is this map. So this is the map that shows average uh, test scores, averaged over all the grades we have, all the subjects, all the years we have uh, at the school district level. And uh, these are, we've measured them in this scale in grade level equivalents, so the dark purple is more than two and a half grade levels below the national average for the grade kids are in, and the dark green is more than two and a half grade levels above the national average. So you can see there's an enormous amount of variation in the academic performance of students across the country. There are big parts of the South where achievement is, is you know, one to two or more grade levels below average for large regions. There are parts of, of uh, New Jersey and New England where average achievement is, is two grades or more above average for lots of places. And then there's a lot of variation within states uh, around that. So that's a huge amount of variation. And so clearly kids grow up in different places with different amounts of opportunities to learn. 
So the question is why. Uh, so the first thing we wanted to look at is to what extent is that variation related to kids' socioeconomic status, the socioeconomic conditions of their families. So for every school district, we construct a measure of the, the average socioeconomic conditions uh, in the community. So this is sort of an index of family income, parents' education levels, uh, poverty rates, SNAP eligibility rates, unemployment rates, and single parent household rates, I think. Uh, and so zero means sort of average, and positive means above average, and, um, and negative turns out to mean below average. Uh, so you can see there's this enormously strong correlation between the academic achievement of the average student in a school district and the average socioeconomic family conditions in that school district. That correlation is about 0.8 to 0.85. That's a huge correlation. That means that socioeconomic conditions alone are an incredibly powerful predictor of the average performance of kids. Remember, this is average performance of kids. That's not to say there aren't kids in those school districts on the left that are performing well above the national average, and there are students over here who are performing well below. But, but the means are quite highly correlated with socioeconomic conditions. That said, there's considerable variation around that line as well. That is, it's, it's not a perfectly uh, perfect correlation. If we look just at the 100 largest school districts in the United States, you can see that even among really big school districts, there are some with relatively similar levels of socioeconomic condition, but substantially different levels of academic performance. So the, the biggest one there is New York, uh, LA is below it, uh, Chicago is off to the left. Um, and you can see, you know, LA and New York don't differ that much in socioeconomic conditions, but New York average achievement levels are a grade level or so above those of Los Angeles. So clearly, socioeconomic conditions aren't destiny, though they are powerful predictors. And so trying to understand, A, what besides socioeconomic conditions is relevant, but B, what's the mechanism through which socioeconomic conditions relate to achievement? It, it may not be what's happening in families. It may be that the neighborhoods are better, and, or it may be that the preschool opportunities are better, and maybe the, the K-12 schools are better in those places. That is, it, it, it's not clear what the mechanism of this. It's just clear that, uh, that there's a very strong relationship. You might have noticed in the map before that, that Massachusetts was sort of greenish uh, on that map, and California was sort of purplish on the map. Uh, uh, so here's another way of looking at this. So now I've highlighted in white all the school districts in California, uh, and in red all the school districts in Massachusetts. And, and Massachusetts is higher achieving than California, not just because it has more high-income school districts. It does, but that's not the the real reason. The real reason is that even among school districts with the same level of socioeconomic conditions, school districts in California have much lower average performance levels than comparably uh, poor or low income school districts in Massachusetts. So that says that, all, that some of this variation uh, here isn't, isn't maybe even a local school district factor, but maybe have something to do with, with characteristics of the state. State policy, state funding for preschool, uh, state funding for K-12 education, particular education policies, and so on. That it's not, it may not be, and the solutions may not sit locally to some extent. They may sit at a, a, at a different level. So if we come back to our picture here, um, these are the, uh, these are the, this is the map I showed you before. If we adjust for socioeconomic conditions, uh, we get this. So now we've sort of, we're basically measuring how far above or below that, that, the center of the regression line I showed you before is. And now the South doesn't look nearly so bad, right? A lot of the reason why test scores are low in the South is because poverty rates are very, very high in those uh, along the, the black belt of the South. Massachusetts doesn't look so great. Massachusetts partly is doing well because its students are coming from uh, much higher income families. California still looks kind of lousy, right? Uh, uh, maybe not quite as lousy as before, but there's a lot of purple there. If we zoomed in, you could sort of see some, some green in, in our local environment here. But you'd also s see some not so green if you went over into East Palo Alto, for example. So there's a lot of small scale variation that's a little hard to see at that scale. So the next thing we, we've looked at with these data is the extent to which achievement uh, grows from, say, third through eighth grade. So if you follow a cohort of children from third grade in 2009 to fourth grade in 2010 and so on, and say, how, how, how do they improve? Because in some sense, uh, 
that tells us something about their opportunities in the elementary and middle school years rather than opportunities that may uh, have accrued or, or not been there in the earlier years. And so if we look at that, we're going to compute the average change in scores between third and eighth grade. And I, I'm going to say this with a caveat, but you can sort of vaguely think of this as kind of an imperfect measure of the community value added. This is the extent to which test scores grow for kids in a given community net of where they started in, in third grade. Um, and it might, I think in some ways you could think of this as more a measure of uh, place-based opportunity than the average scores, because average scores might be driven a lot by selection, by who moves into a community. So if you have a lot of highly educated parents uh, who are investing a lot of time and money in their kids, they may be doing well in, by the time they get to third grade, but they might have been doing well by the time they got to third grade no matter where they lived, right? But by elementary and middle school, the, the community, the school system, and opportunities in community may, may matter and may be evident in differences in growth rates. Now, that's, this isn't perfect, and so it's, uh, I don't want to overstate that, but I think it's, it's worth thinking of. If we look at a map of growth rates, so green, dark green now means uh, children are growing 25% faster in average performance than the average student in the country. So, uh, and dark purple is 25% slower than the average student in the country. So that's a sizable change. That means sort of, uh, you know, five years of growth in a four-year period, kind of catching up by a whole grade level or falling further behind by a whole grade level. There's a lot of variation across the country in growth rates, but it's not patterned at all in the same way as the other one is. That is, you still see some purple, say, down in the south, but you see a lot of green in there, too. You don't see nearly as much sort of solid green up in parts of New England. California doesn't look nearly so bad when you look at growth rates, right? Uh, so so the, it turns out the correlation between growth rates and starting conditions is only about 0.2. That is, there's a, a, a very weak correlation between where kids are on average by third grade and how much they grow between third and eighth grade. So that suggests the factors that relate to it are quite different. So let me show you an example of that. So this is the, this is the zoomed in map of levels. So this is where kids' uh, average scores are. And you, this, you can see all the dark green of here that you saw before. But you know, if you look at Washington, D.C., dark purple, okay? Kids are on average are scoring a, a couple grade levels below average. Look at Chicago over there, it's, it's purple. Look at Detroit, dark purple. So some of the big urban school districts look quite bad when you look at average performance. But if we look instead at growth rates, Washington, D.C. is growing above average. Chicago, is, students are growing way above the national average, more than 25% above the national average from third to eighth grade. Uh, Michigan is growing, growing, students are growing below average, but not nearly as much below average as their average scores are. There's not nearly as much sort of green up in these areas, right? There are places that kids are doing very well by third grade, but aren't particularly learning any more rapidly than the average kid in the country by eighth grade. So that says there's a really different story about what's driving growth rates than what's driving average achievements. And if we think of average achievement as some sort of uh, measure of the quality of schools or something, we may be missing a lot because we may be just capturing kind of selection effects. If we look at the correlation between socioeconomic conditions and growth rates, so now a one here on growth rates means kids grow an average of one grade level of test scores per year, right? That's what they should grow. Uh, and anything above that is above average growth, and anything below is below average growth. You can see there's a modest correlation with socioeconomic status. Growth rates are a little bit faster in the more affluent communities, but not a whole lot faster. That correlation is a little less than 0.2, so that's not particularly robust. You can see Chicago out there is the sort of big dot, outlier dot, right? Chicago is, is relatively poor, but growth rates are way above average. I, I initially have to say, initially I thought that had to be a mistake because I, I, my prior was, no, oh, Chicago schools aren't particularly great, right? But we looked actually at the NAEP TUDA data, which is an independent way of looking at it. And in the NAEP TUDA data, which has Com comparable test scores, you see exactly the same thing. The difference between fourth grade and eighth grade two test scores in Chicago are way above any other large district in the country. So that's not an artifact of a problem with our data. It's, we see it in other data as well. So that suggests there's, there's a lot of variation in growth rates and learning about what drives that could be really important for thinking about uh, how to improve schools in general or opportunity more generally. 
When we look at Massachusetts versus California, you don't see that same split anymore. On average, Massachusetts growth rates and California growth rates are about the same condition on socioeconomic status. Um, and then this map, this just shows if we, you know, I had the big scatter plot with all the dots, but if I took them all away and just did it, drew the line for third grade, that's the black line you can barely see. And then for eighth grade, it's the white line. So what this is saying is that the relationship between socioeconomic conditions and average performance gets a little bit steeper from third to eighth grade. But it's already really steep by third grade, so that a lot of what's driving that relationship between per test performance and socioeconomic conditions doesn't look like it's happening in the school years. It's certainly not happening in the three to eight years. It's happening before kids get to grade three, early childhood or in, uh, or in the elementary years. It gets a little bit steeper over those grades, but only about 15% uh, steeper. So a lot, of, a lot of the action is happening earlier than, than our data, which suggests that if we want to think about you know, where the real action is in reducing e uh, inequality of opportunity, we might want to be thinking in the sort of earlier years, not the, not the middle years. Um, uh, what is this? Uh, this is the SES-adjusted growth rate. So this is growth rates, but now taking out the socioeconomic conditions. It's not terribly different than before. Uh, but, you know, one, like, Tennessee stands out. School districts in Tennessee generally, kids are growing faster than you would predict based on the socioeconomic conditions there. Florida, not looking so good on that, right? Um, and so here we can start to see some evidence that maybe there's some state conditions that might be relevant. The other thing I want to show you is just we did some very simple correlational regression analyses just to sort of see what factors about communities are related to both levels of performance by third grade and then growth rates from third to eighth grade. So we, this is from uh, a multiple regression model where we have a bunch of variables in and not some other controls that aren't shown. But what you can see is that a lot of these factors are strongly related to test scores at third grade, but more weakly are not related to growth rates. So, uh, you know, racial composition, percent black, percent Hispanic, percent Asian are strongly related to the test scores by third grade, but only weakly related to growth rates. If you look at percent of English learners, for example, districts that have lots of English learners have much lower test scores by third grade, but they grow much faster uh, than average from third to eighth grade, quite possibly because English learners aren't able to perform well on tests in the early grades because they're not yet proficient in English, but as they become proficient in English and can take advantage of the uh, instruction in their schools and whatnot, they learn quite rapidly, or at least their performance on the, on the test goes up quite rapidly. And so it may be that, that the distinction between the levels in third grade and the growth rates later is, an art, is a feature of the kind of learning trajectories of English learner students. Uh, if you look at, say, instructional expenditures, conditional on everything else in the model, school districts that spend more per pupil have higher test scores in third grade but no higher growth rates from third to eighth grade. Uh, so whether that's because the spending really only matters in the early grades, this is not a causal model, so you shouldn't go out and decide that you should only spend money in third, K through two and no, spend no money after that. that would, I, don't, I don't think that would be supported by this, right? But it, but it suggests whatever the mechanism that drives those correlations operates differently earlier on. Um, uh, it may be spurious in the sense that it's catching other stuff. The last map I want to show you is this. So this is a four, we categorize all the districts in four categories. So the blue ones, students are performing above average in third grade and growing faster than average from third through eighth grade. And the, the red ones, kids are scoring below average in third grade and growing at a below average rate from third through eighth grade. Um, and you can see, so the, the south sees a lot of that. In New England and many just small districts in the Midwest are more blue. The interesting ones, I think, are the orange ones, which are places where kids are scoring below average by the time they get to third grade, but where their growth rates and test scores are above average from third to eighth grade. And so there's a lot of orange places that it suggests might be interesting places to learn from in, in terms of educational policy and practices that lead to high levels of growth in places where kids are coming, you know, getting to third grade at a, at a lower level of performance. So Tennessee stands out, for example, in that regard. But so does a lot of California, right? 
California has, is generally orange and red, which means kids in third grade are below average, but a lot of it is orange, which says kids are learning from third to eighth grade faster than average. So it's, I think this gives us a much more nuanced picture of performance than just a kind of a static, how are kids doing at a certain point in time level. The last thing I want to uh, say is a little bit about the racial uh, uh, ethnic achievement gaps we've looked at. Um, and so if we want to know, look at wh where are racial gaps larger or smaller, can we learn about uh, either conditions in communities or schooling factors that lead to lower racial achievement gaps? Uh, we have a lot of school districts to look at. So first of all, this is well, not the most depressing picture I'm going to show you, but it's among them, I think. If you look at all the school districts in the country that are majority minority, that is majority black and Hispanic, uh, those, are the, those are the white ones. That is, you know, all the, you know, there just aren't affluent or upper middle class communities in America that are predominantly minority. If the, uh, so I think that's sort of sets the stage right now. Most black and Hispanic students go to school districts that on average are uh, well below the the poverty level, uh, but th so this may be the most depressing picture. Though this next one, so this is uh, this is uh, a version of what was in the New York Times. If you saw that, and their graphics are a lot better than mine. But uh, what we have now is the same scale of socioeconomic conditions, but the white dots represent the socioeconomic. They re represent the white students in the school district. So, like this dot means white students in the school district came from families with this socioeconomic conditions and had this level of achievement. And you know, the red dot means black students in this district came from families with this level of socioeconomic conditions, had this level of achievement. So you can see, first of all, there's very few districts where black students on average come from, uh, you know, above, above average uh, socioeconomic conditions. Most black students are in districts where they and their black peers are very, very poor. Uh, most Hispanic students are in districts where they and their Hispanic peers are relatively poor compared to the, and most white students are in school districts where they and their peers are above uh, the average socioeconomic status in the United States. So that's, the horizontal is just a, really just a picture of the combination of racial disparities in socioeconomic status and racial segregation in the United States. The vertical axis then is the achievement of, of those groups, and so you can see uh, white students have higher average achievement than Hispanic and black students. But even, even black students are in school districts where, where they and their black peers are you know, above average socioeconomic conditions. There are such places. They're not very big. They don't have very many black students. They have much lower average test scores than white students with the same socioeconomic conditions, right? Uh, in fact, there are 950 school districts in here that have black students. That's about, we only plotted school districts that have 100 or more black students per grade. So these are moderately large school districts. Um, but that's about 80% of all black students in the United States are in those 950 districts. And there are only 18 of those 950 school districts in which the average black student scores at or above the national average. That is, there's only 18 of these dots that fall above the line. The other 932 school districts that black students are in, uh, the average black student scores below average. And the opposite is sort of true for whites. There are very, very few school districts where the average white student scores below the national average. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, but none of them are excusable. Uh, so I, th that, I think that this actually was a more depressing picture than I imagined it would be when I started to make it. So, so the next thing we did was we tried to see what factors in school districts uh, are related to the size of the achievement gap. And so the first uh, candidate is just in school districts where whites are more affluent than blacks, where white students have more educated parents or higher incomes than, than the black students in the district. That's what this measure is. It's a sort of difference in the average socioeconomic status between whites and blacks in a school district. And the vertical axis now is the achievement gap, the black-white achievement gap. And here it's measured in standard deviation units, not grades, like I was measuring it before. So multiply this by three to get grades. That is, the largest black-white achievement gaps are about more than four grade levels difference. So these are huge. 
But you see this very strong relationship between the socioeconomic disparities in a district and the achievement disparities in a district. Uh, so, but even places where there's no racial socioeconomic disparity, that is, even over here where the black and white students in a district have the same levels of income and education and poverty, the average achievement gap is still more than a grade level, right? So socioeconomic disparities don't explain the gap entirely, and, and we don't have, even in places where we don't have a socioeconomic disparity, we still have a big racial gap. The other thing about this picture that I think is important to note is there's essentially only one school district in the country that has an achievement gap near zero. Of the several thousand school districts that we have shown here, and, and that's this one over here, and this is Detroit. So Detroit has no achievement gap, no white-black achievement gap, largely because, not largely, but entirely because uh, the white students in Detroit are just as poor as the black students in Detroit and score just as badly on standardized tests. In fact, white students in Detroit score lower on standardized tests than black students do in Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C. is this up here. Washington, D.C. has one of the biggest achievement gaps in the country. Uh, so, so Detroit is not the example for how to eliminate the achievement gap in, in America. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, it, I mean, it does have no achievement gap, but that's not the way to do it, right? Uh, where are the places with the big achievement gaps? So there, there are kind of two kinds of places. One is they're big cities uh, with large socioeconomic disparities. So Atlanta, Washington, D.C., Oakland. These are big urban districts where the whites are much, much more affluent than the blacks, right? Think of, think of the north-west, uh, southeast divide in D.C., for example, right? Or the north-south distinction, segregation in, in Atlanta. Those are places with, with big racial disparities and socioeconomic condition and correspondingly large achievement gaps. The other places, though, are Evanston, Chapel Hill, Berkeley. Those are the kinds of towns that most of you will spend the rest of your lives in, uh, which suggests you have an opportunity to do something about this. Uh, but, but these are not places where there's, uh, there, there is a sizable so socioeconomic disparity, but they have much larger achievement gaps even than you would predict based on their socioeconomic disparities, right? Uh, and so what's going on there? Well, one factor for some of these districts is segregation. If we look at the relationship between the achievement gap and this measure of segregation, this is a measure of the difference in the poverty rates of the schools of the average black students and the average white students in a district, uh, which is sort of consistently the measure of segregation that's most strongly related to achievement gap. Places that are more segregated, that is where black students go to high poverty schools and white students go to low poverty schools, have bigger achievement gaps, net of everything else, uh, than, than less segregated places. This holds up in every regression model we have, no matter what kinds of things we put in at this measure of segregation, is always strongly related to the size of the achievement gap. So, so, that's, so those two factors, socioeconomic disparities uh, in family conditions and racial socioeconomic disparities in school enrollments, that is high, high poverty schools, are, are two of the three strongest predictors of the achievement gap. But the, the third one, the third predictor, is the average level of socioeconomic conditions in a school district. Affluent communities have bigger achievement gaps than less affluent communities, net of everything else. So, you know, if you went back to this picture here, think about, you know, places that are up here where the whites are really affluent and the blacks are less affluent but still middle class. Those places, the, the disparities sort of here are much bigger than the disparities in, in poor places. The, uh, so th this is, I think, somewhat surprising because it suggests that even in the places that have a lot of resources where you think maybe we would be ma making the most progress in reducing the achievement gap because the schools are well resourced, resourced the communities, the neighborhoods aren't terrible, right, uh, that m maybe we would that would be the kind of place we should look at. But those places actually, on average, have bigger achievement gaps than, than places like them, that is, places with equal levels of disparities, uh, that are poorer. And so I think one possible story for that, though we haven't tested yet, is that in places like Chapel Hill and Evanston and Berkeley and other affluent uh, kind of communities, the competition for educational success is, is sort of ratcheted up, and in those places, Disparities in resources matter a lot more than they do in places where there's not this sort of heightened uh, parental anxiety and competition around educational success. 
So uh, a racial disparity between whites and blacks and family resources matters a lot more in, in Berkeley or Chapel Hill than it matters in, in Oakland, for example, be because of the, the kind of competitive or anxious environment around it. That's my hypothesis. We haven't, we haven't tested it yet, but um, sometimes people say, well, are the achievement gaps bigger because white students are doing a lot better or because black students are, are doing worse when you look at things like segregation and affluence? And the, everyone does better in more affluent communities. It's just that white students' gradient on socioeconomic conditions is much steeper than black students, and so you get a kind of widening disparity. Uh, you can see that here. You know, the, when black students are more affluent, on average, their scores are higher, but it's not as steep a gradient as you see in the white one. So that's part of it. When you look at segregation, I showed you earlier that segregation is not related to average achievement, but the more segregated a place is, the higher the scores of white students and the lower the scores of black students. So, so segregation doesn't change the average, but it seems to be related to lower scores for blacks and higher scores for, for white students. All of this same stuff holds for the white Hispanic, but I didn't want to show you all the pictures. They look remarkably similar when you look at white Hispanic gaps, white Hispanic disparities. All the same predictors uh, uh, hold as well. Uh, so I am going to... Uh, I'm going to end there. I hope that was some food for thought, and I think we have time for discussion, questions. Thank you. <laughs>